Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you looked around, if you've gone to the store, if you've paid any bills lately, you know that the cost of living isn't cheap. Every month those costs seem to inch higher and higher. It costs a lot just to live in this world in which we're in. It costs a lot to make car payments, to make house payments, to make insurance payments. It costs a lot to eat the things that we want to eat and to go the places that we want to go. The cost of living isn't cheap. Of course, well, we don't expect it to be cheap. We expect that there are costs associated with day-to-day life that we simply have to pay. And we've learned also by years of experience that the best quality things also have the biggest prices. That's not only true of the things that fill our houses, our apartments, and our garages or storage spaces. It's also true of the love that fills our lives. Real love costs a lot. Jesus makes that clear to us. He says, in the chapter after our gospel reading, no one has greater love than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. Yes, the love that Jesus has for us cost him his very life. He didn't love us just with sweet-sounding words. He didn't love us merely in a sentimental kind of way. No, his love was a matter of sacrifice, of self-sacrifice. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which at that day was the most shameful way to die. There, hanging in agony, naked, in full view of, of all passersby. Love caused Jesus to walk that way of the cross. It caused him to be obedient, whereas we were rebels against God's will and his commands. Love made Jesus seek out sinners in order to save us. Love made Jesus the friend of the friendless and the outcast. Love made Jesus carry our sins on himself. Love made him trade the the perfect life of the glories of heaven that were his by right as the true eternal God in order to live on this earth among miserable, sinful people, most of whom rejected and scorned and hated and abused him. Love caused Jesus to die for us so that we can live forever. Wherever men, women, and children believe in this love of Jesus, there is forgiveness, life, and salvation. It comes to us at a great cost. As the Apostle Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 1, You know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from from your forefathers, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So we see very clearly that there is nothing cheap about the love of Jesus. And so also, correspondingly, there can be nothing cheap about our love for him. And so we see Jesus say in our reading, If you love me, hold on to my commandments. Some people have the mistaken idea that they can love, that they can love God by just their words alone. They think that talk about love is the same thing as love. But it's not. I can't just talk about buying a new car because that won't put a new car in my driveway or my garage. I could just talk about a vacation, but that won't get me and my family to a sunny beach in Cancun or in Florida. Talk is cheap. Whether it's talk about cards, greeting cards, or vacations, or love. We only talk about love while resisting God's will and his commandments, then we simply don't have 
real love for him. Real love is what Jesus expects of us. And that's why he wants us to show our love. Think about a relationship between a husband and wife. A husband says he loves his wife, but how does she know that he loves her? Well, he can talk about his love for her, but if he acts like a stranger at home and cold and and careless, is that real love? Real love is expensive. The cost is high. It means taking time to listen, showing that you truly care. It means doing things together, sharing wealth and possessions, showing affection and concern for one another. Love means making decisions with the best interest of the other in mind rather than of yourself. It's putting the other first and yourself last. That's how it is with loving Jesus. It's putting God first, other people next, and ourselves last. And that's what God's commandments are all about. We see the the commandments summarized in this way in the Bible. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. So again, we see that true love puts God first, others second, and ourselves last. That's the kind of love that a certain widow in in Jerusalem had that Jesus observed and which he used as a point to teach about love and sacrifice. Because this poor widow loved God first and herself last, she placed her entire wealth, which amounted to just two small copper coins, two pennies, Her entire wealth she put into the temple treasury as an offering of love to God. So great was her love that she could do no less. Think about another quintessential example, the love of the good Samaritan on the road to Jericho. Even though he was uh, of, of a different ethnicity than the Jewish man who lay beaten and robbed on the side of the road, who even his own countrymen passed by because they couldn't be troubled to stop and help him, yet this foreigner, this Samaritan, by ethnicity, uh, uh, traditionally hostile with the Jewish people, he was the one who stopped to bind up the wounds of that beaten and dying man on the side of the road. He wasn't afraid to get involved. He, He cared enough to give of his own time and money. He provided more than enough money to the innkeeper where he took the wounded man to pay for whatever costs there were for his recovery. And he promised if there was anything extra, to pay more when he returned. He did it because he loved his neighbor, even someone who had been a total stranger to him up to that point in time. He loved his neighbor as himself. That's the way it is with true love. It's a way of thinking and loving. It costs plenty because it costs obedience and surrender. That's the price of love that keeps God's commandments. Now, paying that price can be a drudgery for some people. It can be a long and frustrating battle. If you try to use God's commandments as a way to earn your ticket to heaven, well, you'll find out that obeying God's commandments is no easy task at all. Commandments will always be a burden for those who try to work their way into God's kingdom of heaven. Keeping the commandments for that reason will never work out in the end. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. How different it is for those who trust in Jesus for their salvation. For us, the commandments are not a burden. Instead, they become a wonderful way that we get to express our love for God, for Jesus, our Savior. Yes, it's a costly way, but it is the only way. And to help us do this, Jesus promises something very special. In verses 16 and 17 of our reading, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. 
Now, that was very good news for Jesus' disciples at that time because they would definitely, very soon, need another counselor besides Jesus himself. Jesus had told them that he was soon going to be leaving them visibly. He talked about going away as somewhere where no one could follow him. Very understandably, that troubled his disciples. But Jesus assured them that he was not leaving them helpless and all alone. No, he would send another counselor to be with them. And this counselor is the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit does not aid those who oppose Jesus. He is not a friend or advisor of the sinful world. He's not a helper of the proud or arrogant who resist his work of converting their hearts. The Spirit aids those who know and believe in Jesus as their Savior, which faith itself is also a gift from him. He is the great counselor of God's people everywhere. When you think about it, there's not a person alive today who who couldn't use or, or doesn't want a counselor. Who of us doesn't need a friend, someone close by to lean on, to give advice, uh, to give encouragement in difficult times? Who doesn't need a helper who is ready with, with just the right word of advice at the right time? In fact, we know that some people will pay a very high price to have a counselor to advise them on all different kinds of things, about investments and about medical conditions and legal matters and personal problems. But our Counselor with a capital C, the Holy Spirit, he charges no fee for those who believe in Jesus. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit shows us the truth about what is right and wrong. He shows us what it means to walk in the way of God's commandments. And he aids us, he gives us the the power and the strength that we need to keep those commandments. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 1, I'm convinced of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So with help like this, we can pay the high cost of loving Jesus. Yes, it's a great cost, but our counselor is willing to give us the assistance that we need. Through his word, through his sacraments, he is eager to make us strong in our love for Jesus. He is eager to enable us to pay the high price of Christian living. Is it worth it? Is it worth it, this high price of the great love of living for Jesus? Our Lord assures us that whoever pays this price will not be disappointed. The disciples were far from disappointed. At first, of course, they were confused, They didn't know what to think when Jesus told them in in our reading, I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Of course, we know that Jesus was talking about his death and resurrection. But the disciples still at that time didn't yet understand the, the full reality of what Jesus was talking about. And so when Jesus died on the cross and was buried, everything seemed to be finished. His work seemed to be destroyed. His disciples felt alone and abandoned. It seemed that their love for Jesus up to that point had been just wasted effort. And they felt that way until Easter, until they saw Jesus face to face, risen from the dead. And then Jesus came to those who loved him. He came with resurrection life. Now the disciples knew for certain that Jesus was truly one with God the Father. And they knew now that their own lives depended completely on Jesus for eternal life and salvation. They knew that just as Jesus had promised, he certainly would always be with them. Jesus still comes to us today. He offers us the same resurrection life that he offered to his disciples. When people believe in Jesus, these words of his come true. Because I live, you also will live. Who wouldn't pay a high price to have this life, eternal life? Who wouldn't give up the treasures, all the treasures of this world, 
in order to have the guarantee of life after death, of a perfect, eternal life with God in heaven. But we don't have to give up the treasures of this world in order to have the eternal life that Jesus offers. This life comes as a free gift to those who believe in Jesus as their Savior. Other people may spend a lifetime of searching for ways to prolong life in, in any way that they can. People today, especially through modern technology, are able to, to stretch out and prolong life even to 100 years or more. But eventually, all people must still die. That's not true for those who believe in Jesus. Yes, even though our bodies may die, yet Jesus' resurrection guarantees us that we will pass through death into eternal life. Jesus' resurrection encourages us to keep on loving him. As Jesus says in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Jesus loves us very much. And he expects our love in return. He doesn't want a cheap imitation love. No, he expects the real thing. He says in verse 21 of our reading, The one who has my commands and holds on to them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and show myself to him. We can rejoice that God pours out his love into our lives. He doesn't simply dish it out by little spoonfuls to us. No, he dumps it into our lives by the truckload. His love overflows into all that we do. His love blesses our work, our play, our joy, and our sorrow. His love brings Jesus into our hearts. And there, in our hearts, he makes his home. There, he comforts and reassures us. There we have every reason for paying the high price of love. And it's what we want to do, because he first loved us. Amen.